Welcome, everyone, to another episode of LifeSpark Live, The Complete Shift, where we take the time to have national conversations about senior health that no one is having. Together, let's get to the heart of the matter, to an ever-growing aging market, revealing the opportunity, mindset, and solutions for a much-needed, complete shift in senior health. I'm Joel Tyson, a nurse, CEO, and the host of LifeSpark Live. I'm so excited to talk data, depth, and humanity with all of you. Let's get the conversation going. Good morning, everyone. And I am very excited today to do a, <laughs> there's Nick already, doing a podcast with one of my favorite people in the market, in the space, in the world of geriatrics, Dr. Nick Schneeman. Nick and I have known each other and known about each other for quite a few years, and Nick was uh, was was a guy that I always looked up to in the market. He built the largest geriatric company in the state of Minnesota, one of the probably the largest in the world, actually. I would probably say Dr. Nick is always impressive, uh, and and you know somebody I always wanted to work with. Uh, it just it just worked out like things sometimes work out. And what we were really missing was truly understanding geriatric expertise at a medical level. And so when we had the opportunity, we jumped at it with Nick, and we're so happy to have him here. So as we get rolling, Nick, maybe, you know, from an opening standpoint, what are a few ideas and thoughts that you have about, uh, about your experience so far at LifeSpark? Well, uh, thanks for having me, um, uh, and hiring me. Um, I've been delighted to be here. Uh, prior to coming to LifeSpark, uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to practice in a lot of different settings. Uh, I did primary care in the clinic, uh, hospital work every day. Yeah, uh, really for over 20 years. I uh, was fortunate enough to start a couple of geriatric inpatient units. Um, certainly worked in the home uh, with a couple of senior service companies that I was involved in. And, uh, and across all of those settings and uh, different business platforms, um, what I'd like to say is what we're doing here is really unique. Um, you know, in all those, there's a lot of single solutions, you know, um, a lot of care coordination, a lot of APP models, um, and what we're doing here at LifeSpark is wider and deeper than anything uh, I've seen. So I'd like to maybe dive into the deep part. Yeah. I think everybody knows about the wide part, right? right. We have the multiple businesses. We have human resources across PT, OT, speech, LPNs, you know, AP, we, we've got this wide you know, group of people, but we also are going deep into the uh, expertise part. And uh, I'm hoping we can touch on uh, that a bit here today. Yeah. And I think that's a perfect setup. What we thought the best title to, to this little talk that we're having today is geriatric consult anyone, <laughs> right? So no one's ever really kind of experienced that. So we, Nick talks about that because he does know what a geriatric consult is. So let's talk about that a little bit. And and really, what does that mean, Nick? And who's asking for that? And why is that important when you say geriatric consult anyone? Joel came up with that uh, with that question, and it really resonates with me because the, the God's honest truth is you can't get a geriatric consult anywhere. You can't get it in the ED. You can't get it in the hospital. You can't get it in a multi-specialty clinic. Um, it's just not out there. Uh, there's no access to it. There's people just not doing it. So... Um, so that, that, that really uh, resonates with me, and uh, there's many, many reasons for it. I don't know. Do you want to go into some of them? Yeah, maybe a little bit, Nick. Like, you know, because I think a lot of people that are viewing this and listening to this, you know, they're in the geriatric field, right? And they, they, they know that there isn't a lot of geriatricians out there, but they might not know that there's only 7,300 of them in the entire U.S., right? There's one per every 10,000 geriatric clients, one per every 10,000. So uh, for me, I know that's one part of it, but, but absolutely, w talk about what, why are people not getting something that's so, so rudimentary and so obviously in a common sense standpoint, given these geriatric populations, help, help us out. Help well, those yeah, out. well, I mean, the root problem goes back to your wheelhouse, our wheelhouse, uh, and the villain is fee-for-service. Mm -hmm. You know, these consults uh, take time, um, and uh, they provide incredible value. You know, they lower costs, they improve experience and outcomes, um, but uh, that doesn't work in the fee-for-service model. So um, if you hire somebody like me who's going to, you know, maybe see four to eight patients a day and spend an hour doing this consult, we'll talk about what the consult is in a little bit, um, you know, you go out of business in a, in a fee-for-service model. That's why we don't see geriatric clinics 
popping up all over. They, they come and go, often tied to academic institutions and nice ideas and philanthropy, but uh, they're, they're not uh, attached to sustainable business models like what we're uh, building here. Um, and then on the second, you know, very astute, uh, not enough geriatricians out there, um, and that's all tied to the economic model. People just aren't interested. It's one of the lower paying professions. I've been fortunate enough to actually practice in value-based um, settings where it actually can be very lucrative uh, for physicians uh, if the business model changes a bit. Uh, in Minnesota, I think we have two geriatric fellowship spots, and they don't fill every year. Wow. And, and this is in the setting of the age wave. Yeah. You know, it's, crazy. it's just unbelievable. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I read something mm-hmm. recently that, um, back to what some of the points you were making, is that geriatricians are paid like 20000 less than an internist on an average. They're having to get trained in additional, you know, in their in their, in their their uh, academia. They have to go and, and do another year of work and all that, and, and yet they're getting paid less than an internist on average, right? So it just all doesn't make sense to your point about the reimbursement pay. And then talk a little bit about the unfortunate stigma of geriatrics as a physician. Um, <laughs> well, that low pay is probably the biggest <laughs> yeah. stigma, right? Well, you're, and, not and saving, we, you're not saving people with <laughs> cardiac surgery or doing the brain surgery. Oh, yeah. Right? It's, it's not sexy. That's what <laughs> that, you're getting to. That, it right, hasn't right. been sexy. Uh, it never has been. Uh, but we can make it that. Yeah. Uh, I think we can we can flip that on its head a little bit uh, yeah. here. I, I will say this. Um, of all the physicians that I've enticed into the profession over the years, uh, I don't think any of them left. And, uh, and that's actually been studied. Uh, some of the happiest physicians out there in the marketplace are geriatricians, despite the low pay. Yeah, that's a really good point, Nick. So why do you think that is? I mean, people went to medical school, not everybody. Some guys went to medical school because they're the smartest, you know, man or woman in their class. Yep. And everybody said you should become a doctor. And really, they should have been an engineer or an architect. Fair or enough. Right? And they wake up when they're 40 and they're struggling. Right. Uh, but the people with, you know, emotional IQs that are very high and really have a vocation to serve others that join uh, are looking for jobs like we can provide in geriatrics and not just burn and churn. Right. Um, and all this burnout uh, is not because people have been mismatched when they went into medical school, but they've been mismatched in the marketplace. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, physicians are humans too, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so they're all humanitarians in, uh, when you have the opportunity to serve really in the vocation right. in a real way and see the, see the longitudinal benefit, I'm sure. So that's great. So thanks for that, Nick. And that's a little bit, let's, let's go back to that. What, you know, Jerry, to consult anyone, you know, what is a geriatric, what is it, tell us about it, what is a geriatric, what would you do, what, what do you do with a geriatric consult? What is it, what does it make up? Sounds like a simple question there, but it's a really good question, because if you asked your average primary care doctor out there, uh, you know, or an ED doc, or the guys who drive the bus, that I like to say, you know, your hospitalists, so, you know, those people that are really uh, managing uh, patients in real time, uh, they know what they get when they send somebody to the cardiologist, or they ask pulmonary to come in a consult. Um, they have a pretty good idea of what they're getting. And I think if you ask those guys, you know, what would you get if you got a geriatric? And they wouldn't know. Mm-hmm. So maybe we should talk about that a little bit. That's what I'm asking. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> so tell them, what is a geriatric consult at a high level? Well, right? one, there isn't one model. Okay. You know, some Fair is enough. neuropsych testing, two hours of stuff. Some is this whole multidisciplinary team where you yeah. spend a whole day, you know, often tied to academic and stuff. But these aren't available, again, in normal things. The life spark. A geriatric sure. consult is really a five-step uh, methodology. This might get a little boring, so um, go ahead and interrupt me. Uh, but the five steps, when I go and see somebody at the request of a primary care physician, one of our life managers or an APP, or based on you know precision engagement scores, however we're identifying these folks, uh, it consists of these five steps. One, storytelling. Two, summarize that story. Very powerful. We'll talk about that. Three, um, elicit hopes and wishes, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, four, uh, write an acute care plan for when something happens. And five, uh, review the chronic care plan in light of these new discoveries about what people uh, are going through and what they're hoping for. So can we start with the first one? Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like pretty common sense, but important, right? Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't sound like many people get that because obviously there's so many people that are scrambling and struggling with their experience in home and community and beyond as a geriatric 
completely. person. Yep. So go ahead. And and you can hear those five steps. Absolutely. You, could you think you could do those in eight to twelve minutes in a fee for service? <laughs> yeah, not not that, and also not given the fact that a normal primary care experience with a senior is thirteen minutes a year. By average, wow. 13 minutes a year based on the data. That's how much time a geriatric person is able to spend in a PCP relationship on an annualized basis. So the first step is storytelling. And what that means is um, coaching the client and or their family um, to tell the journey from independence and wellness into complexity. Um, and that's different for everybody. Uh, for, for somebody, it might be when dad lost his car keys 10 years ago. Somebody else, it might be, you know, stroke or car accident three months ago. And suddenly, uh, life has become really complex. But it's really important to let people tell that story. And you learn a lot. Mm -hmm. I comb through electronic health records, and I've gotten very good at looking at stuff. When I hear uh, the story from the client and the family's viewpoint, I get incredible insight into what's going on. And so there is some coaching to keep people on track, right. you know, um, but you, you get there mm -hmm. and you hear about faith, family, and friends, Great. you know, you, you hear about their quality of life uh, currently, those kinds of things. And then once the story's done, you go to step two. And this is kind of a magical step that doesn't happen in healthcare. And it's called summarizing or restating that story. Um, Again, hard to do in a brief office visit and take some training to take that 15 to 20, maybe a 30-minute story that you just heard, condense it into, here's what I heard you say about mom. Mm -hmm. You know, back on the farm about eight years ago, she, when you go through the whole thing and then you end with what the current quality of life is, and she's happy every day now, doesn't recognize you anymore, uh, but or, you know, miserable and, uh, you know, act of wish to die, or mm -hmm. it could be very different. Everybody's sure. story is different, but spitting that back to the client and their family is powerful. They feel like they've been heard. Right. And I hear that all the time. This is the first time. This is the first time, you know, that anybody sat down and actually heard this whole thing. So and that, so. that matters. And I think it's really important because it's, it's, it's not what you say, but what people hear and to be able to push that back in a thoughtful way is really, I'm sure, I can't imagine, like for the first time, somebody feels like, wow, like people are discovering with me and exploring, not just telling me what to do and treating me like a patient or a piece of meat, right? And I'm not advocating anybody's doing that, but it, it becomes depersonalized many times for these people. So I love the the process. So that's step two of the cons, the geriatric console. What about step three? So step three, and the order is super important. Yep. You can't skip around. Got you. Because once people have felt like they've been heard. Now there's trust already. Yep. Even if the first, first visit, it's amazing. Um, and now you can ask about what they're hoping for. Gotcha. And people will share in a way that they, they wouldn't if you just started with that. Um, and so what are you hoping for, you know, for yourself? What are you hoping for your mother? Um, and they can be very different. And actually there's good evidence to show that even spouses and children, um, don't correlate with what the client is always. That's not surprising. <laughs> That's not surprising, right? Right. So then we get those hopes and wishes out there. Yeah. And then we coach a little bit to, you know, what's realistic. Mm -hmm. You know, what could we really accomplish here? And usually there's a lot. Um, and I've also been super impressed with how Americans choose different things with the same stage illness, the same life complexity, the same perceived or real uh, level of suffering. You know, people really do have different different goals. And sure. So, sure. Um, so you get that, and that becomes clear then, okay? Yep. So now we're done with step three. We go to step four. Um, and you can mix up step four and five. Those are the two steps. You can go either way. And sometimes we don't do it in one visit. Might have to come back for a different one. But mm -hmm. step four now is writing that acute care plan. So what are we going to do when the you-know-what hits the fan? Mm -hmm. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, mom's on the floor you know, or fever and, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. we're going to walk through that in a very detailed fashion. You know, are we going to do CPR if somebody experiences natural death? You know, are we going to go to the hospital? What kind of levels of intervention do we do? So all of this is done in advance in a way in context of story, values, hopes, and wishes that the plans stick. Um, Pulse forms or provider orders for life-sustaining treatment. Yep which you're very well familiar with. I don't know if our viewers mm -hmm. are, but these are orders that go on people's refrigerators or in um, charts in, uh, in medical facilities. 
um, about what to do in case of an emergency, it's notorious that they don't stick. Right. You know, but inside of the context of this consult, they stick. Gotcha. People really get it, and, and these plans are often followed through. So now we're done with the acute stuff, and now we get to, but I think it's really a lot of the fun stuff, is uh, making sense of the chronic care plan so it fits the picture now. Sure. So, you know, 90-year-olds on 15 medications, seeing five subspecialists might be the right plan, but often in context of this consult, it's not the right plan. So what we'll train our folks to do, and part of being able to do a geriatric consult, is to look at a complicated medication list and unpack it. And uh, we call that indications, efficacy, safety, and cost. So we go through each medication with the client and or their surrogate um, and, uh, and discuss whether it has FDA approval and the weight of evidence to uh, use for the current indication. If it doesn't, does it make sense based on uh, other evidence? Um, and then the efficacy thing, does it fit the goals of care and the prognosis? Um, uh, safety issues. Um, physicians are have actually been shown, again, in evidence to grossly overestimate benefit and uh, grossly underestimate harm, particularly when it comes to frail elderly people sure, sure. And, and complexity. And so... Um, so we're very honest about those things, too. And then typically at the end of that uh, intervention, uh, medication lists get smaller. You know, iatrogenic or physician-induced illness becomes uh, less of an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and people often actually thrive yeah. and get to that magnificent, magnificent life they, uh, they really envision themselves, uh, even in late life. Yeah, you know, I'm just sitting here listening. That's a, obviously, it's a, it's a process. It's a method. It's a it's a humanistic kind of like thing that you'd think would be just like normal in how to help these folks. Right. Gosh, you, you know. know, doesn't it? I mean, it just seems like, you know, you listen, you, you, you paraphrase it back, you put it into a plan. Right. And, and I would just challenge you on the acute care plan. I'd say, I'd like to call it the preventive or proactive acute, you know, of acuity, right. Instead of calling it acute care, right. Maybe Cause hopefully bit. you want to we'll work be, on that. Want, we'll yeah, work yeah, on the pre-acute plan, right. right. The pre-acute <laughs> right. plan. I'd have to bust Nick on that a little bit. Right. <laughs> and then, you know, but it, it just seems like very common sense. And so, so thanks for sharing that Dr. Nick. I mean, that's, that's powerful. And, and I can see, and we can all see with our own loved ones, even, you know, how, how that process uh, could be impactful. And I think it was great to start with the fact of why it isn't there and that it isn't, doesn't show up very often. The, the processing of people with physicians burning out because they're just asked to do more and more and more in a fee for service model. And, you know, there's no space to listen and be human and, and do, do really your best work. Right. Cause it's, this is really about long-term comprehensiveness, which we call complete senior health versus react to fix the problem. Just back to your drug question or your drug uh, describing some of these, you know, problems with some of these medications. And I mean, I know you know this, but I'm just, it makes me think of all the, subspecialists and other people that are in play for a lot of these physicians when they have chronic conditions where you have three or four or five different physicians trying to solve individual problems. And all of a sudden you're dealing with a big mixed up mess of, of chemicals that are f coursing through the you're, arteries you're and hit, veins of these people. Yeah, right? you're, you're hitting on um, the last part of the fifth step, the chronic care plan. And that really right. is serving the function of the integrator for subspecialists. You know, um, I have many friends that are subspecialists that are great at their job. They know right. more about their field than I do. Um, but they're lacking that integrator because many of these people are seeing three or four. Right. Right. And often the plants really don't fit together well. And so that is part of that fifth step again is talking about each of the subspecialists and, you know, what's their role and what is uh, our role at LifeSpark yep. to make sure these plants get integrated in a way that they respect the wishes, the prognoses, uh, the values of, of the client themselves. And, uh, and that's a super fun role to fill when you have the time. And when you don't have the time, um, it causes the new term, moral injury. Yeah. You know, if you're a primary care doc, you know, churning through 20 to 28 patients a day and Edith shows up, Full of all this complexity, and yeah, you don't and have you don't time. Yeah, you don't want it, but you also, and, and you've got three subspecialists to manage, and you just can't do it. It's, right, it doesn't feel good. So, Nick, one thing that I know that we deal with at Lifespark and you deal with is this whole issue of you know the health system's been built on a medical model, on an acute care model, and then you know when I grew up, we had family practice, and I love that because it really felt like 
a lot of what you're talking about. Like I knew my doctor Jensen and he handled all of our family issues. And, and then we went to this whole PCP thing and I was kind of like, whatever. And I was in my teens and later twenties and thirties and forties. And I was like, I never even knew really who my PCP was because I didn't use the medical system and acute care much. And then as I'm getting older now, it's more and more important, but now we've gone to subspecialty. So now you have this subspecialty PCP thing and it just feels awkward and it doesn't feel like that single point of thoughtfulness that you mentioned in how you do a geriatric consult. So my question is, is how does, you know, I mean, we've sort of created this sort of like perspective in the market. At least the market has like PCPs are, have all the answers and they're your go-to single point of contact. But as we've mentioned, it's not really the case because they don't have the space or the time and they're not really set up that way. But how do you work with those PCPs, PCPs and do they feel like you're taking their cheese? I mean, is there is there any rub between like what a PCP would do at the at the clinician level or even at the system level, right? Because that becomes a problem too. Maybe it's not at the, clin- the, the individual level, but it could be at the system level for kind of the following the money, if you will. Can you talk a little bit about your experience and how we either can manage those clients as a PCP, if you will, or a subspecialist? Because I think... What, how I see it and how you, you've shared with me and how we've built it out is really we can go either way. We can be the PCP for people that don't have access or, you know, that need us because that would be great because we really play that role. But the one there is also when they really have a vested relationship, how does that become non sort of like confusing and, and positive? Right. Um, well, let me just start with it's been very well received in my career, um, and, which I was uncertain of early on, uh, but, and we should get to like, you know, who's the right person for us to be seeing. If we're nailing the right person based again on our precision engagement scores or referral patterns, um, this is a huge value add for a primary care physician who's working on the future service. Um, Again, Edith in a wheelchair, incontinent, confused with a stressed out daughter in a 15 minute visit. Um, We can take that off their hands and help them uh, collaboratively provide a much better experience and outcomes uh, for the client. So um, they just don't know it because it's not accessible to them. Right. Like I said, they know what they get when they send, go to cards, go to renal, go to pulmonary. Uh, they, they just don't know about it, So, um, which is an opportunity right, right. for us uh, as a company, that's for sure. Um, and then uh, from the subspecialty standpoint, I've never gotten any, any pushback. That's great. Um, I mean, they're they're looking for, I don't want to dis primary care because you know I'm a family physician and geriatrician sure. by trade, and I I've been in their shoes. You know, it's it's just hard to do it under that economic uh, model, and so we're here to partner with them now as primary care transitions to value, as we hope mm-hmm. will happen in this country. I think there is more opportunity for us to really co manage um, and help work with the people that are in their homes and serve as that wing, you know, so to speak, but but really help the primary care physicians develop their skill sets in geriatrics, serious illness discussions. How do you look at a complicated medication list and re-prescribe? How do you negotiate individual treat- treatment targets for diabetes and hypertension that are different than what they've been taught? Right. You know, I think there's really an opportunity for us to get there. And we have a couple health system partners that we uh, are working on pulling it up with. Yeah, Nick, that's really interesting. And when we're talking about PCPs and, and the relationship, and I'm glad that that works and we can work with, and we do work with two health systems that way. And I, I find that really positive. At, at the same time, you know, with the complexity that there is and the access that there is, it also, I'm kind of stuck a little bit with like this thing that I'm wondering, like there's so many people that 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 don't understand some of the geriatric expertise and principles that you're talking about. And yes, we can help them with that and we can be that subspecialist, but I just don't know if primary care by itself is equipped to do it. It's, it's no different. Like when we look at children and we have pediatric hospitals and we have pediatric everything, I mean, pediatric subspecialist, like everything is pediatric, everything. And yet when I look at a child, not to say they're not complex and we should have like some unique kind of things there, but like you look at geriatrics when all there's this polychronic, there's, there's this issue that you talk a lot about restorative versus palliative care. I mean, there's some real complexity here, lifelong. And, you know, how does that sit with you as far as, you know, that these people, they need someone that has these levels of expertise to really sort it out in my, in my mind. I mean, how do you feel about that? I mean, versus traditional, 
you know, yes, it's a quarterback, but I mean, primary care and geriatric specialty is not the same thing in my mind. Yeah, I mean, I'm hearing a couple of things there. Yeah. Well, one, there is a lot of similarities between pediatrics and geriatrics. Mm-hmm. Um, some dissimilarities, too, because, sure. like you said, there's resources put into pediatrics. And That's what I mean. We as a society have bought into that. That's and, right. Uh, and it's uncanny that we're exploding with seniors and we haven't invested in a different uh, kind of model. And, you right. know, who is my client? It's it's the client, but it's the family, too. Very similar to pediatrics, very different than a 40-year-old you know, independent man going to a clinic. So, so there are a lot of similarities there. Um, so I, I don't know why we haven't v- invested in it. I think, again, the villain is fee-for-service, and um, and some of it is on doctors. Mm-hmm. Um, physicians have exited stage left from the business platform. You know, you're Dr. Jensen mm-hmm. that you talk about. Yeah. I, I'm guessing he owned his practice. He did. Yep. And he was invested in the success of that practice in a – in a way that was different than just being the doctor. Um, and and that is just isn't true anymore. 90% of the, the uh, primary care docs in the Twin Cities uh, don't have any investment in the business platform. They work often for a nonprofit, you know, a healthcare organization and uh, exit uh, training programs, uh, you know, with a goal of negotiating the best salary and the most time off right. and benefits and, you know, uh, and, and go to work and really aren't in, and, and, and so, you know, I think if they could have some light shed on their work environment, they should all be raising their fist and saying, we are not seeing old people under fee for service. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I think that that moment's going to come one of these yeah, days. Yeah, that's great, Nick. And I, you know, I say this, but I, I want to put everybody even up one level higher at the organizational level. I said, I said, you shouldn't be able to be doing really, if you will, kind of quarterback in our primary care, unless you're in full global risk. I don't think anybody should get, get these half-baked kind of proposals where they have upside only and all these kind right. of fee-for-service models. Little performance improvement you should be, projects. You should absolutely be in global risk. If you're not willing to take the risk, you don't get the right to be the quarterback. If you do, great. Be the quarterback, right? So I think that's interesting, and that gets to be a provocative topic for sure for many out there. And But it, it, is, it is Can we pretty, riff on that a little bit? Sure, sure. So global risk, right? It's up and downside risk in, yeah. a, in population health with yep. a pool of, of patients. Um, you know, some people worry that, well, the doctors now is just going to not give me medicine and not send me to the surgeon to save money and that kind of stuff, right? Well, that, that ethical risk is real. Mm-hmm. But who do you want managing that? Mm-hmm. The health plan? Right. Politicians? You know? Right. <laughs> or people that chose to serve, Right. You know, I agree, Nick. I mean, that's that's where your passion comes out, because that's so true. Right. And we've been battling this collectively. You and I, I know for a lot of years together. So, right. well, listen, I love this. This is a great place to turn into something really fun for everyone, I think, is so, you know, we talked about, you know, it's like you know, geriatric consult that he won. Right. So we've talked about what that means, what that looks like, how it works, you know, why there isn't a lot of it. Right. Why we're doing what we're doing. Right. As a company, we're trying to change that. Right. And we're Doing it in kind of, a, if you will, some of the reasons why is we do have an, you know, everybody likes to be an is these days, but it's kind of an ageist thing, right? Because we don't value our seniors, right? Like really highly. We value our kids, right? But we don't, we're kind of the old people, they go to the old folks home, they kind of have problems, they have a hip, you know, fall, break, and they, they, you know, they die, right? That's just kind of the age old story. But we don't think that's cool, right? Because we lose all that wisdom and all that passion and all that family and community with our seniors. And we need to make sure they're healthy, not sick. And we got to get on the side of health, which is population health. So I think we covered all that ground. The thing that I would wrap up with here, which I think is great, because you're awesome at this, and I know how much you care about this. But tell us what it looks like. Tell us a story about somebody that you've recently served. Like when it goes right, like how, how, what, what does it look like to be a, having a geriatric consult in this in this LifeSpark model and and getting it right? And what what's truly the value? Right, not the economic. We talked about economic value, right? Because we've talked about that. But more, what's the real value here when you do this work? And it's like, what gets you up in the morning? Why you do that? Why do you do this work? Because I, I think I know. But tell me a story. <laughs> Quadruple lane, baby. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's an opportunity to do more than one thing really well. I mean, you can really um, make certainly a huge improvement on clinical outcomes. Sure. You know, um, uh, helping people 
have better cognition, uh, live longer, restore to better health, palliate when it's right, and transition yeah. to great end of life care when when the time is right. So. So the clinical outcome part is super fun, and that is why I get out of bed in the morning is to do that kind of stuff, uh, not the executive stuff so much. Uh, and uh, But then also improve the experience for, you know, the family. I mean, even if you have a good clinical outcome, sometimes it can you know, not, not feel like it was very caring or a very good, you know, experience for families and their, their loved ones. Um, and then the workforce. I'm very passionate about the workforce. Yep. And, you know, people who chose nursing, physical therapy, you know, become a doctor or whatever, you know, did it because they want to help folks. And, um, and they leave those training programs uh, very idealistic. And, again, uh, 20 years later, moral injury. You know, they are burning out and not being able to do what they can do. And, you know, here at LifeSpark, we're providing a vocational opportunity, I think, that can help them uh, avoid that piece. And, and, and then, you know, the last part is doing our part to lower uh, cost uh, to help make Medicare work, yeah, uh, sure. I think is, uh, it's pretty cool too. Well, you're talking about a ta- as a taxpayer, but so that's awesome. And that's really the, 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 the pieces and parts, but what I, let me ask this again. So tell me a story about Bob or Millie or Jenny. What does it look like to them? All right. So Mary's, uh, uh 88 years old, yeah. um, <clears throat> survived ovarian cancer, uh, including a recurrence 10 years ago. And about five years ago, she started showing some cognitive impairment. Um, LifeSpark's not involved. Uh, we get engaged uh, within the past year with the life manager, uh, doing some co-management with uh, external providers, and uh, Mary is just failing. She's been in the hospital a few times, uh, and people really think it's time for hospice for her, which it, it may be. Um, she has been over-treated with antibiotics inappropriately for something called asymptomatic bacteria. She doesn't really have bladder infection. She's just positive urine cultures every day of her life. Uh, gets C. diff colitis from it. I mean, life is just going down the tubes, and she and her husband are struggling to keep her in their home. And so the life manager uh, uh, brought us in to do a consult, and we did the five a geriatric step. consult. A geriatric oh, consult. Geri- oh, one of those geriatric in consults. their home in their too. Home. Yeah, yeah. With, <laughs> in their excellent. own. Okay, yeah. So, okay, <laughs> okay, so it's, yeah. So you do the. So it sounds like a crap show so far, yeah. literally, so right? We, with we do the five thing, thing, and we, we hear the, the whole thing. story. Yep, you know, yep, from tell me. oh, that's great. From so, surviving, so far, you know, it's not so good. I'm not feeling uh, life-threatening illness, ovarian cancer, into her into her dementia, which nobody has labeled. You know, she's got Alzheimer's. Nobody's labeled it. Uh, And now, uh, you know, she's on 12 medications, being overtreated for hypertension, and people are ready to uh, give up on her. She's sleeping 20 hours a day, can't walk anymore in a wheelchair. Uh, Fast forward two months later, she's playing bridge with her friends. Wow. I mean, there's a lot of detail in okay, there. No, look, you just told me you cypress. And it was a team. It's not right me. There. It's know, not but, me. It's the whole team. You so you did that geriatric console. You did that plan. And then how did it morph over? And then tell me about the bridge. But how did it so morph? So we to- heard the story. Yeah. Spit it back. Yeah. Build trust right away. Yeah. What are you hoping for? Yeah. Got empowered to manage the sub- subspecialist. Yes. Got empowered to change the medication. So she... We actually added one, too. Uh, I found out she was in atrial fibrillation and probably was having little TIAs uh, along the way okay. here, too. And so, so started her started on yes. anticoagulated, reduced all of her other medications. She got stronger, uh, walking around, mentation improved, got back to playing cards with her friends. Uh, I mean, it... You know, so we restore people. This is not just a palliative care end of life How did her family, program at Life. What about Park. her family? How does her family see? This is a woman that was basically heading south. Yes, she was heading south. She, she was, was south. She was south. She was yeah. She was south of the border, right? And you pulled her back. We when, when all we her, pulled yes, her back. Yes, what, I love that. All these hope doors cl- were closing for her and her family. And all of a sudden now, like you said, this woman is playing bridge. Yeah. She's still got Alzheimer's. Yes. But so her what? life is so much She's better. Happy. And her husband, too, is, can care for her. And how he, does he's family, not going to see her in the nursing home? feel that we're probably just thought, this is it for yeah, her, right? They're, they're life spark fans. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to say the least, right? <laughs> right? See, Nick is modest. So, I mean, this is life changing. Like, this is why we do geriatric consult. Right. This is why we... We have to really work as interdisciplinary teams, for real. People say that, as you know, it's lip service, right? But at Lifespark, we're working really hard, and Nick's working really hard with our teams to build this truly integrated approach where it's not just one or the other. It's not being righteous or right. It's not being 
you know, there's, like you said, there's a, there's a life manager, there's NPs, but there's also MDs. It's not just an NP model. And I should say just, but this is a concentration of expertise and licensure that, that really puts this in a whole different mindset of complete senior health for these people. And it's what you, what you just shared, I think is important for people to understand that it doesn't always work out to people playing bridge, but it will always work out to the best outcome. Right. Well said. Well said. So I think that's awesome. And I don't have anything else, Nick, because I'm always inspired by you. And I just want to thank you today for being on the podcast. And more importantly, want to thank you for being a true geriatrician that's committed to the profession and committed to humanity. So thanks for that. Thanks, pal. All right. Thank you.